So now we're going to be contrasting that to the Islamic worldview. Right? In terms of benefits, what are some of the benefits, inshallah, of going through this is that liberalism shapes how people literally breathe in this world. How they eat in this world, how they taste in this world, how they think in this world, how they perceive in this world. All of it is shaped by your worldview. And so, this causes Muslims to have so many doubts in their principal issues. So, what ends up happening is either you're forced to take a mubtadir, an unorthodox position, or you end up just disbelieving. Or it's a slippery slope. So, all these questions, modern doubts, the age of Aisha, the capital punishment of hudud, of apostasy, the, you know, what's it called, anything else you can think of, all these other doubts that people throw your way, these are all just symptoms. They're just symptoms. They're not the disease itself. So I could sit here and give you a course of doubts, but that's not beneficial. Because it's not addressing the disease. And the disease is a different world. So the question then becomes, why is it that all these doubts came about in the last 100 to 200 years? 100, 150, not more than that. Why didn't they come about earlier? Why didn't our scholars ask these questions? So, and, and unfortunately, this is part and parcel, like it's, it's, it's so deep, it's institutionalized. It's in, the, it's in the very fabric of society. The way society is weaved together is part of that thinking. And so, when you go through high school here, when you go through university here, you will be forced to engage with these issues. There's no way out of it. And it's not even just here anymore. You know, we talk about the West versus the East. That's a, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty weak differentiation. There is the dominant ideological West, which part of that is every rich person of the world. So the rich personnel of the entire world, whether you be in the East, whether you be in the West, Egypt, Pakistan, wherever, Saudi, it doesn't matter. If you're from the elite, you are ideologically Western. There's no two ways about it. So there's the West and its hegemony, its control as an empire across the world and its world order. And then there's everybody who doesn't make that cut. So they're below them. They're not worthy of their values. They're not worthy of their beliefs. Okay, so that's why they need to be given dawah by bombing them in democracy and killing millions of babies in Iraq. Right? Killing millions in Afghanistan. Because they are not worthy, so we need to give them our dawah of democracy and liberalism. Right? That was literally the logic and rationale used by the colonizers. And up till today, that's what's happening in Israel, in the occupation of our lands. Right? It's the ugly underbelly of secularism that they want to kind of like still defend somehow. They're, just, they're doing it very clearly. They're doing it. Right? But anyways, these are some of the benefits, inshallah. So you'll be able to see the bigger picture, not just address the question. But don't agree with the premise. Be like, hold on, hold on. What makes you assume that I agree with X, Y, Z in the first place? Why are you assuming that these things are true? What proof do you have for these assumptions that you're holding? Why should I agree with them in the first place? These questions, inshallah, so the goal of this program is to be able to make you think at least in a way that's outside of the ideological box of modernity, inshallah. Like, again, from the other benefits of this will be, it will help you in giving da'wah. It will help you at least form stronger identity for yourself and be able to give da'wah in a better way. Like, these are some other benefits, appreciation of a compelling critique. You should start appreciating that there can be intellectual critique the philosophers have always believed, and this is not true, that if you can intellectually disagree with something, if you convince yourself that something is true and something else is false, then you will naturally believe it. 
That's not true. This is where shahawat come into play. This is where hawa comes into play. This is where these things... So you can know something to be the truth, but you can still reject it. Right? You'll be able to appreciate the search for truth. Allah shows the truth, let us follow it. And let us see Ba'atil to be Ba'atil. It allows us to stay perfect. So, so it's part and parcel of that growth, inshaAllah. Okay, this also needs to be incorporated as a part of the tabi of our children, brothers and sisters. I cannot stress this more to you. Wallahi, just did it. Just the other, just did it. I had. People come to me, this happens to me all the time. All the time, this is nothing new. My children have stopped practicing. They went to high school, something happened to them. I don't know what to do anymore. They have amazing grades, they're not dropping out, they're not doing bad at school, they're straight 90 students. But they just don't want to practice anymore. They have doubts. Where does this come from? It comes from this. It comes from not even recognizing that you're up against a worldview that is not neutral. It's very much antagonistic. It's very much in opposition to the worldview of Islam. And the children are being baked into this ideology throughout the entire school system. So if we cannot incorporate these types of beliefs and their critique within our tabiyah from an early age, we've already lost them. Because we don't even know what the problem is. Remember, not the symptoms, the disease. The disease. Right. Meshi, it again, a serious study is required, even at a basic level, right? Too many social media personalities claim to deal with this matter. However, they do not provide a rigorous and satisfactory response. So it's one thing to just blame modernism, feminism. Mm-hmm. It's just one thing to just use the words. And it's another thing to actually have a good understanding of these issues so that you can, when you address them, you're addressing them with actual knowledge. You're understanding them, even, even if it's not like an at a added level. Because yeah, I mean, it's part of your, like I can, I'm starting to see things. I can, I can see that there's principles that are different. I can see that some of this is different. Okay, it's making sense, right? It's not just, don't just use buzzwords. Hmm? Don't just like throw words out there, hashtag feminism. Hashtag anti-liberalism. Hashtag is any have have a level of appreciation that these issues have depth. Mm-hmm. And you should be able to respect the fact that there's a depth that you need to kind of work with. Like, now if those things make sense to you, and before I get to the content, please, for next class, bring your friends. Bring anybody in the age group that I'm talking about. Early parents, young adults. University going, postgraduates, you know, professionals, bring everybody from the community because genuinely speaking, everybody needs to hear this. And they all need to deal with this. Like it's not because I'm teaching class, it's so come. That has nothing to do with that. It genuinely has to do with the fact that people really need to understand these issues. Right. Let's get through what the content will be, inshallah, uh, for this program. And um, before that as well, we might tweak it depending on how things are going. So I did have an intention, I had an idea, to do a traditional method, to do a traditional book of Aqidah, and then apply these certain types of doubts and framework issues to our paradigm in a more synthetic, organic way. So it's so it's it's organic. We're just building off of our aqidah. So you can see, look, this is a regular book of aqidah. It has basic masail of aqidah, and this is how we are expanding the paradigm. We are furthering our framework of reference of ideas in a very consistent and traditional manner. There is no gap. It's not like the stuff we're going to be doing today. The stuff we're going to talk about today is separate from our aqidah or from the things our ulama have spoken about. They are not. They are not. It just requires us to present it in a more easy, newer format for people to be able to work with. And this is how knowledge works. With a newer generation, there's usually need for newer books, same concepts, 
just present it in a way that people can digest it, understand. Right? So let's see how things go, inshallah. And let's see how the people are. But please, I do expect that if you start, at least carry forward so that there's a level of growth and benefit as you come along, inshallah. And I promise I won't let the classes go above 55 minutes, inshallah. And so that way, nobody feels like, oh man, it's a Monday, I gotta get back to work. Uh, like, yeah, this is really all good, but I don't want to be sitting here until like 10 p.m., right? So inshallah, let's not do that. Let's get to the content. In terms of content, uh, it's divided into three parts, this program. The first section is on worldviews. What is a worldview? How do we understand it? And then, modernity versus Islam as worldviews. What are the differences? And we'll spend a little bit of time on that. Then we'll compare. Then we'll talk about some defining features of modernity. What are some of the sifats of modernity? How do we experience modernity today? And so it's one thing to you know what the worldview consists of. You know what its little gears are. It's clicking gears. That makes the machine. That's one thing. And the other thing is like these are its sifats. So let's take the example of. What's your name, brother? Hmm? Tabarak. MashaAllah. Allah. 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 So, say you heard this brother Tabarak here. He consists of a body and a soul. And that makes him a next. Right? And he can hear, see, right? And what else? Can you see? Yeah? Okay. So he can do all these things. But what defines the body? It's his personality. What else, right? It's how we get. It's how we deal with people. MashaAllah, Brother Tabarak has beautiful character. Right? MashaAllah, Brother Tabarak is going to be a leading scholar in the future. Say, I mean. I mean, inshaAllah. These are all the features of what Tabarak is aspiring to be. So these are his defining features. And likewise, the worldview has defining features that you know, they, they bring out what it really means for this to live through something. And so we're going to take our time with this, inshallah. Then this, the third part, which should have been a separate section, the Sa'adat al is part of here, is what is the secular? What is the secular? Look at the words thrown a lot around a lot. What is the secular? Um, after that, we're going to get into section two, which is an account of liberalism. So we're going to have an account of liberalism from different perspectives. The first one is a theoretical account of liberalism. What does that mean? What does that mean? We're going to be talking about its usul, its principles, its theoretical framework, X, Y, Z. This is its axioms. This is how it works. That's part one, and that's quite important. The second part is a historical account of liberalism. Right? And remember, the historical account of liberalism is not different than the account of modernity. It's not different than the account of secularism. They're all part and parcel. They're all just different. They're different gears of the same machine. Right? Then we'll have a bit of criticism of liberalism from an academic standpoint. So it's not just Muslims who are criticizing, but other people as well, atheists as well, post-liberals as well, you know, communists, you have socialists, you have Others who critique it. But then you have the third section, which is the relationship with Islam. Right? So we're going to talk about a historical relationship of liberalism with Islam. Then we're going to talk about the contemporary relationship of liberalism with Islam. Then we're going to quickly talk about how to survive this muscular liberalism. Because again, liberalism is always showing its muscles, you know, bombing the entire world. Making sure it is seen to be the same to the guiding path for everybody. And any other path is false, it's wrong. The only way to true enlightenment is democracy. The only way to true enlightenment is human rights. What do these words even mean? Why are we just accepting the wholesale? Are they native to Islam? If not, then we should question what they even mean. And how we're going to juggle with them and understand them. Right. Alrighty. So, so those are the three sections, inshallah. Before we start, any questions about the material? I, I, as I said, inshallah, if we're able to get through a good portion of this, 
We'll move on to a method, inshallah, of aqidah, and then we'll apply worldview building, aqidah building, uh, from a traditional standpoint. Any questions? My question is, what do you mean explaining all these things? I learned the domain of the Quran teachings, or what the modern scholars have taught. Yeah, absolutely. So some of it, uh, basically the entirety of it is from an Islamic standpoint, from the Quran and Sunnah, from our principles. That's, there is no harm in benefiting from critiques that are done from non-Muslims. And we've always had a policy like that. The Prophet said, in the hadith, that is a little bit iffy, but the ma'ana is okay. That wisdom is the lost treasure of a believer. Wherever he finds it, he takes it. So you can have solid critique, you can have solid points, solid things being said by non-Muslims and you accept them. As long as you tell them the truth. Right? So why the Prophet them told us that to accept the truth even if, even if it comes from your enemy. Be just even if it's against yourself. What does that even mean? Hold to justice, hold to truth. Right? So the paradigm is obviously of Islam and Quran and Sunnah. But we will obviously incorporate academic critique as well that comes from the a wider scholarship. Cool? Yes? Just accepting. Look at what the Chinese did for our Muslim brothers and sisters. 
So, I mean, again, it's not, yeah, I mean, we shouldn't be supporting, oh, you know, they should become, this, we should be finding our own ways of bringing back the superiority of Islam that is uh, in the world, uh, as a dominant world view. Like, that was a bit of a tangent, but I think this is fine because we're treating it like a course, inshallah. This is not a one hour presentation that I need to finish up, but I can take my time, inshallah. Um, like, another thing is, I'm sure you've all seen, this is something that I don't do generally huh, for mass public. This is something that's specifically catered for people who are interested in studying about this properly. So I don't go around giving lectures like this, generally speaking, actually. Huh. Number one, section one, world view. And this is a very important part, so I will take my time with this, inshallah. What is a world view? Ha, huh. before we get into it, when I ask some of these brothers here, and sisters in the back as well, when you think of a world view, what comes to mind? When you think of the world, the word world views, what comes to mind? Go ahead, it's fine, you can be wrong, I just want to hear. All the work and see the world that you think about Yes, how the way you would conceive the world, faith, what else? Teachings. Teachings. Muntaz, yes. There's more. Yes, I have the glasses. The glasses, Muntaz, by which you will view the world around you. If you want to explain that a little bit, what does that mean to you? So, I can be wearing a certain pair of glasses that allow me to see the world the same as color red. And you can be wearing, someone else can be wearing glasses that can make me see the world in color blue. We're both seeing the same thing, but because of our glasses, we're describing what we believe in different things, even though we're technically looking at the same thing. Montez. Glasses that we see. Montez, Montez. Where did you get that uh, parable from? Very nice, mashallah. Very nice. So that's a very apt example, which is that they are like the lenses via which you see the world. Are you constantly aware that I'm wearing glasses? Or at some point you just start seeing things through them? And that's it. You just see things through them, right? And if you take them off, then it's not going to make any sense, right? Then what am I looking at? Right. Sometimes you're looking for your glasses, but they're on your face. Why? Because they're so innately part of how you're perceiving things. Right? So these are the most fundamental beliefs that you hold. Right? They are the most fundamental beliefs and assumptions about the universe, about the cosmos, about what you inhabit. Right? Everybody has a worldview. Everyone has a worldview. You know, a lot of people are like, listen, I don't trust organized religion. I'm skeptical of like everything. Like, how do you, that's a product of a worldview right there. That's a product of a worldview. You know, I'm going to look at everything objectively. I don't want to be like, you know, I don't want anybody to put on any like, you know, things to scare me with religion and God and heaven and hell. Don't be objective. That's, that's literally the product of modernity. You have very, you have quite a few assumptions right now that you're talking about and beliefs of the world that the only thing that exists is material. Nothing else really exists. And so through that, that's the only thing I'm going to be fundamentally assessing the world. And we'll get to that. But the point is, everybody has a worldview. People are just love, don't hate. Yeah, that's a worldview right there. Right? Listen, I do yoga and I do Reiki. But I don't believe in religion. That right there is a worldview. It's a product of a worldview of postmodern thinking. Right? So, if anybody says, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm without a worldview, that's not true. Because everybody has their most fundamental beliefs and assumptions about the world that they inhabit. Yes? Yes, I am. That's humanism 101 right there. All races, all genders, all colors, all religions, they're all the same. I'm just human. 
That's a literal humanism, one on one. And they think they've figured out something new. That's just a philosophy. And it has very, very strong assumptions about the world. And it has strong critiques from all across the board. You follow? But everybody says, oh, why do you need to philosophize everything? Why do you need to make everything so difficult? It's like, listen, you can't just accept X and not believe that it's that you can't defend it spiritually and so on so and intellectually. You need to be able to do that. Especially in the world we live in today. Right. Okay, anybody else have any examples of somebody who might say, I have a neutral worldview? Huh. No? No, so any predisposition might be part and parcel of your worldview. It's not the entirety of your worldview. That's not it, right? Any predisposition, we know that to be the top in this time. Others might call it something else. What it does do is it reflects how one would answer all the big questions of human existence, right? So all your big questions of the world are answered through your worldview, right? It's the conceptual frame of reference on how people look at the world, right? I'm going to give another example now. One's worldview is the paradigm in how one looks at the world. Worldviews shape and inform our experience of the world around us, right? You can't just simply say, you know, it's shaping how I'm going to be interacting with the world. Muslims are more cognizant of the different worldviews. Why? Here's another example to further clarify what a worldview is. How many of you here are bilingual? Okay. Yes. All right, a little bit, just a little bit. All right. How many of you here are trilingual? Okay, mashallah. I see the hands up over for Punjabi. You know, I see those. I see those, mashallah. Okay. All right. So uh, there's quite a few of us here who are multilingual. Right? How many of you here are just have a single language that you can see? All right. It's just one language. There we go. Good. Now, if you grow up speaking and interacting in more than one language, I think you've all had that experience early on in your life where you realize that you can be talking about something in one language, but it will not translate into the other language, right? Right? So like I'm gonna be talking about something in a certain style with a certain like mannerism, but if I try to convert that over into the other, it's not gonna fit. You know. Um likewise there's like parables, you know, there's examples, there's idioms, there's all sorts of different things in language that they are very different. The the structures of grammar are very different. Right? All these things are, and then you experience them firsthand, and so you're, and so you're able to think in more than one language. You might alter. Sometimes you might be thinking in Urdu. Sometimes you might be thinking in Arabic. Sometimes you might be thinking in English. Right? So you might alter how you're thinking depending on what you're thinking about. Sometimes if it has to do with home stuff, you might be thinking in the language you grew up with with your parents. But then if you're thinking about something that has to do with like the academy, with something that has to do with like uh, something with the economy, you're going to start thinking in English. And why is that the case? It's because you recognize that I'm more comfortable in certain things in certain languages. Actually, world views, and you can write this one down because I don't think I have any slides. World views are the languages of thought. They are the language through which you will interpret the experience of the world. Let me give you another example. How many of you here, mashallah, use Waze, Google, Google Maps, even for even for routes that you use every day? Okay, perfect. All right. And generally speaking, we all want to say that uh, we know our way. But I just want to look at the traffic, right? That's generally why we do it, right? Okay. And how many of you, I don't want to be pointing fingers, how many of you drove cars before 
internet access was that easy. And before, you know, you had to actually memorize the way the places looked. And you know, you had to look at landmarks and so on and so forth. Okay, so I saw a few kinds of tags go up, mashallah, to Allah. May Allah preserve you guys, mashallah. The, the experience of driving of those roads it had, it's being interpreted through your reference of your Google Maps. Does that make sense? So the very way you're interacting with the road, and the very way you're perceiving these roads and these traffic lights is through the reference of your map. And the guidance it's giving you. That's why there's some people, mashallah alayhi, They'll be driving and says, take a left and they'll go left into nothing. They'll get off the road. And then when you ask them why, is the map going to So what did it do? It was primary in shaping the interpretation of the experience of the road. Worldviews are the maps through which you interpret the world. They are your language of thought. The language of communicating, understanding, digesting ideas of the world. Of everything in the world and everything around you. Does that help guys? Are you guys with me? Yeah? Does that kind of clear up conceptually a definition of a worldview? Okay. okay. And the more we get into it, inshallah, and the more, the more, the more it'll help. Be it in the time. Mm. Oh yes, yeah. very good, very good. That oh, I didn't touch on. Muslims are more cognizant. They're more aware of the fact that there are different re- worldviews because they need to constantly experience the conflict and the contradictions between different worldviews. The worldview that we are going through, which is a modernity, and the worldview that we've inherited of Islam. And so you constantly feel this push, tug, and pull of these issues. Why the age of Aisha? Why this? What's the role of women in society? What's this? Why all this? You know, all these different... Where are they coming from? It's this constant push and pull between a conflicting, opposite worldviews. So you're very aware of it. While most people are out, you can go to university, you go to school, you go to work. They just live life, man. Right? You know, they might be married, and they have a side thing, you know. And they have kids from her too. So it's all good. But the moment second marriage comes up, stop all the other stuff. You know it's illegal in this country. But hold on, hold on, hold on. What was the difference between these two? So one brother is aware that there's a world difference. While the other one wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Right? Why? Because one only has a single worldview. He's a, a regular non Muslim. The Catholic has only grown up in modernity. They know nothing else but it. Even their shape of religion is experienced through it. But Islam inherits a worldview. It is a worldview, it's not just a religion. And so you constantly feel the pressure of a different worldview on you. And then your loyalties constantly shift. And that's why for certain brothers, their beards come up. Sometimes you'll see them in the religion, sometimes they're not. Huh? Sometimes they're in the wrong circle, sometimes they're in the good circles. Like us with sisters, sometimes they're in the good circles, sometimes they're bad. So you'll see the difference of religiosity there. Part and parcel, a huge part of that is clashing worldviews. Obviously, attitude desire, attitude shahawat, attitude. These are. This is the different. This is the different scope of the discussion. We're talking about the intellectual side, and that is that is a very important side that we always try to tackle in regular halakat, in regular khutab, and so on. So, but we're talking about the gears that are working on the inside. We're trying to figure them out right now.
So the question is, uh, would you say that Muslims are the people who have the most experience with interacting with different worldviews? Actually, I would say no. I would say we have the least experience in terms of just experience, I'll, and, and I'll tell you why. Christianity has the most experience because Christianity is one that lost the war. Do you follow what I'm saying, right? And it became secondary to modernity and secularism, right? And then it had to change through time. So they have the most experience, and we're just guinea pigs at this. You know, we come to the we come to North America and we start saying things like, oh, you know, there's a khilaf about abortion in our religion, and that means something very different in this value system, in this context of ideological wars, right? Than what we're thinking, because we're just thinking of fiqh. But now you're bringing it into this, and this is a different ball game right here. Right? And you just unleashed the beast. And now people are putting you into this camp and that camp and you're, you're saying you're a right, you know, you're a you know you're a right, you know, conservative, and you're a this and you're it's like, bro, hold on, hold on. I just I, I, I just talk about that. You know? So this is why a lot of well meaning duats, preachers who have well intentions, they'll bring up these issues, but they don't understand the context, the depth of the issues that they're facing. Right? So they'll end up just like saying things and they don't recognize like, what are the political, socio-cultural ramifications of not dealing with this in a more holistic way, trying to deal with the real shubuhat, and then giving the fiqhi answer. You follow what I'm saying, right? So like, say for instance, you know, so, uh, you know uh, you're, you're saying a political rally, and, and over there you say, Islam supports X, Y, well, no, no, Islam doesn't support what you're just saying. This is a fiqhi issue underneath the light of obedience to God. And accepting the sharia, this has nothing to do with what you're talking about. These are, these, these are different. Like if somebody asks you a fiqhi question, that's different. Right? I'm asking a fiqhi issue. But this right here is a different discussion to be had independently. Right? People love mixing this in. Because again, so, you, know, you want to get benefit of the doubt, but they don't really know any better. Too many questions? Can I, uh, hold on, you had your hand up. Can, can we wait? Because I really want to get this next part done before we finish, inshallah, which is just the layout of the different parts and parcels, the different gears that are working a world view. Follow? Okay. So keep your hand up, inshallah. Keep, keep, please keep in mind your questions, and I'll ask you at that end, inshallah. Okay. All right. The main components of a world view. And we'll stop here, inshallah. Uh, once we're done, and then we'll get into them in the next class. Contrasting, comparing, inshallah. Like, what are the main components, what are the main gears that make a world click? Okay? So the kind of you have a watch, there's gears going on inside. What makes the clock click, tick, whatever? First is ontology. Ah yes, before we start. Alright, these words are very fancy because they're all philosophical terminology. Alright? Don't get, um, you know, don't feel overwhelmed by them. They mean simple things, inshallah. They don't mean anything very different, that's difficult. But they're there to give access to a lexicon, to a way of speech that will allow you to take a lot of different ideas and just put it into one word. Right? So instead of saying a whole sentence every time, I'm just going to say this one word. That's what terminology is for. Right? This is a hat. This is Muslim al-Hadid. Why do you say hasid? What does hasid mean? What does sahih mean? What does ba'if mean? Huh? What does ahukum tatik mean? What does wajib mean? Instead of saying wajib is whatever you are rewarded for, and if you leave it, then you are sinning for. Instead of saying, I'm just going to say wajib. This is wajib. This is muhabba. This is from the ship. I'm not gonna go out, especially if you know it's terminology. So the so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses certain terminology, those are shari terminologies. And then you have academic conventional terminology. Right? So you have conventional academic terminology. And then you have linguistic meaning. So the linguistic meaning a lot of the times is different than the conventional technical term. So these words, if we broke them down linguistically, they might mean different things, right? Which we'll get to. Um, but they mean something very different conventionally within those sciences that are being said. So don't, so don't get, 
Let me read, let me defend it. So, Matthew, number one is ontology. Ontology is simply the study of what exists. It's the question of, hey, what exists? What is in existence? That's all. What do I believe that exists out there? Out there as in outside of me? Do I even exist? Okay. Like what are these, this question of what exists, the study of what exists is the study of ontology. And so these are the ontological questions of being, of being. Yes. So that's the first one. So it's to say, okay, this is the most fundamental level of study, which is the study of what exists. Play it. Now, if I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, then Allah is the greatest of all existences. Allah is the greatest of all things that are. And so it has its own place of study, which is aqidah, which is theology. Theology or ilahiyat. Who is God? Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is He the Almighty? Yes, He is. Is He the All Merciful? Yes, He is. Is He the All Hearing? Is, is He the All Knowing? Is He the All Powerful? Is He the All Willing? How do we get to know Him? How do we get to love him? What does he require from us? Did he interact with us? And why would he? And so on and so forth. So these are all questions of Aqidah of theology of Tawheed. These are questions of Tawheed. For us, at least it's Tawheed. Right? And for others, it's whatever it is. But actually, Right? So this would be the study of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Uh, so this is the question of theology. Okay, so now we get to a really, really important point, which is, all right, hold on. I'm saying this exists, this water bottle exists. I'm saying all you brothers out here exist. I'm saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. On what standard did I come to know that this exists. And that, then, my friends, is the question of epistemology. Right? Which is, what is knowledge? How do we acquire it? So it's the knowledge of knowing. What is it? The knowledge of knowing. In Arabic, traditional, we use the word, نظريه المعرفة. The nadariya upon which you gain ma'ika. Knowledge. And so, upon your epistemology, will you then affirm X, Y, Z exists, X, Y, Z is true, X, Y, Z is false. How do I know something from true from false? How do I know something is real or something is not real? What is the standard of this? This is the study of epistemology. It's the knowledge of knowing. It's the science of noesis, of ma'rifa. Right. Okay. So now, khalas, I know what exists. I know how I know what I know. And I know how I know what I do not know. This will now lead me to the question of who am I? Which is the question of anthropology. What is a man? What does it mean to be human? What does that even mean? Humanity is where is your humanity? Human rights. The human species. Wow, these words are very loaded. Because According to your worldview, you have a very radically different understanding of what it means to be human. And they're not in agreement, they are not. Just be a good human. I mean, that'd be fine if we agreed upon what it meant to be human. Right? 
or the components of being a good human. Because if I don't know what it means to be human, then there's a problem, right? Okay, then once you're like, okay, I know what it means to be human, then the question of, what am I here for? What's the purpose of being human? That's the question of teleology, the question of telos. Right? Is there a purpose of that, of the universe? Right. And no, 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 no. Let's, let's just clarify something, right? You know, all of those fairy tales and novels and movies that all end with, I found my purpose in life and my calling, that's not the type of purpose we're talking about. Because that is just an acceptance that there's no real purpose for being human, and so you figure it out as you go along. And none of those are real, by the way, because it's all subjective. Uh huh. It's all arbitrary. It's all whatever I feel. Today I want to wake up as a cat, I can wake up as a cat. Because I'm not really human in the first place. What does it mean to be human? This is my calling. Uh, my calling is to sell drugs. And that's fine. Because that's my calling. You know? Because again, there's no real reason for existence. There's no purpose that comes from being human. So. I mean, that's why, right? Isn't that why? Isn't that why? For most people, you can't say, listen, helping this person out, you have to do it. Why do I have to? I don't need to. I can do whatever I want. Right? Like, why? I don't need to. As a Muslim, you can't say, as a Muslim, you need to help your Muslim brother. Why? Because there's a depth of purpose here intrinsic to what it means to be human. That's not there outside of that. It's just whatever I feel like. And we'll get into this, inshallah. We'll, we'll get into this a little bit more later than like that. But there's no real teleology. There's no real teleology in the journey. Okay. Then, if that question is answered, like, what is my purpose here? Uh, and as, as a human being, as a man, what's my purpose here? Then my question will be, how should I behave? What should I do? What should I not? What is right? What is wrong? What is moral? What is immoral? And how do I live my life according to it? What's my ethical paradigm? What's my moral and ethical paradigm? What are morals and ethics? How do I know this is right? How do I know this is wrong? Killing babies is wrong. Beautiful. How though? Oh, just is. Okay. How about sex outside of marriage? How about changing your gender? How about homosexuality? A lot of people will say it just is. But then there's a lot of people, especially in the West, who say, no, that's not the case. Why? What was your paradigm? Right? How, how, how did you get to your moral paradigm? What are your principles? What are your usul of akhlaq, of goodness, of righteousness? Are you literally righteous? Mm. Child marriages are horrible. They are. That's childhood. And where did you get this from? Do tell me, please. What's your moral paradigm? No, I'm serious. Where's your moral paradigm? Or are you just going along as it goes? Right? Did you get this from Allah and His Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because that's what we're told to submit to. Why are you getting it from somewhere else? Are you getting it from another notion of value? Because if you are, then I think those might not be from Allah and His Prophet. They might be coming from somewhere else. And then maybe you need to interact with those in a different way. And our first response shouldn't just be, let me accept it wholesale. Let me have the whole meal. Right? Again, doubts are just symptoms of a greater problem. What's the problem here, guys? The worldview. Very good. The worldview is the problem. And doubts are just 
symptoms to the disease, right? Especially the moral ethical questions, right? The moral ethical questions, they're always brought up, right? But the problem is, we don't even agree on anything that comes before. So why did you just assume that we're going to agree on this moral question? You follow? Alright, so now if I know Muntaz, I know how to know. I know what it is. I know what it means to be human. I know what my purpose in life is as a human being. Now I know what right and wrong is. Now the question is, if everybody agrees on this, how do we then organize society? And that is the domain of law and politics. So the domain of law and politics is the ideal political arrangement. In politics, it's just the arrangement of society. That's all it is. How are we going to order ourselves as a society? Is the question of politics. And law is the question of if we believe this and this, if we believe how to believe in right and wrong, in morality and immorality, in hak and godlin, then how do we make that law? Right. These are the main components, dear brothers and sisters. Of a worldview, and inshallah, for next class, we the next ala, we will get into comparing the worldview of Islam with the worldview of the Dirty, the next ala, the modern worldview. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to venture on this journey with faith, with iman, and allow us to increase it, inshallah, give us beneficial knowledge, knowledge that rectifies the affairs of this dunya and the affairs of this akhirah, be it in the ta'ala. اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم اجعلنا من هداة المتقين الصالحين واغفر لنا وارحمنا يا ارحم الراحمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين questions for five minutes we are going to get into utilitarian thought yes utilitarian thought is a supposed paradigm of ethics for ish, liberalism. And the hard principle is just a principle that is maintained in that paradigm. Yes. Yes. Next Monday, inshallah. Yes, we're coming with the Is scientific what, sir? The scientific theory is part of the philosophy of science. It's not part of epistemology. It is in one way, but not really. It's um, it's part of a certain theory that has to do with studying the material world, studying the natural world. That's all it is. Um, it comes with a lot of baggage, though, because it's part and parcel of a certain worldview, or, or it's adopted by a certain worldview, and then it does certain things. It means certain things. Do you follow? Socially speaking. Yes. Uh, what Islam is not just a religion but a world view, what does that even mean? Let me answer the first one. Actually. Would it be be considered more all encompassing? Beautiful questions. Religion is a term of modernity. And so it's already with working within the technical terms. You guys want to be fancy? You can memorize these terms, and then anybody, any kind of talk to somebody, you can sound very, very special. It's called a discursive grammar. Right? Again, that's just fancy for there's a certain way of speech, there's a certain way of accepting ideas, there's a certain worldview. In that worldview, you have ways of communication, and within that communication, you have a grammar. So it's part of this world. It's part of this worldview of modernity. Within it, it does certain things. Modern religion is already innately secular. The way we perceive religion already is a personal thing. When we think of religion, perceive religion already is a personal thing. When we think of religion, it's a personal choice. 
When we think of religion today, it's something that has to do with the self. Right? Even though Islam, of course, deals with the self, but it's so much more than that. Right? It's an entire worldview. It's a philosophy of being. Right? And so, modern religion is part of the discursive of modernity and secularization. And so it does certain things. You think, listen, to be religious is to be good like this, have a beard, you know, if you're another religion, you have this, right? You eat certain foods, you don't eat certain foods, halal, haram. These are all very secularized ways of thinking about religion, right? Um, so there's a huge scholar, his name is Qalal Asad. Um, he's actually the son of Muhammad Asad. Do any of you know Muhammad Asad? Anybody who, anybody who's Pakistani might have heard of Muhammad Asad, right? Muhammad Asad was the first Jewish convert to Islam who came to meet Sheikh Abdul Abdul Ala Mawdudi, Rahimallah. This is Islam. He was the first representative of the UN, massive scholar as well. It's his son, Abdul Ala Asad, actually. And he grew up in the UK and he grew up in the US. So he's a phenomenal scholar of sociology and anthropology, right? He, he actually mentions this in, in, um, in one of his books on secularism. He says that. Religion is a modern word, just like how terrorism is a modern word, right? And these things, they do certain things within society. They're not neutral, they're not value neutral, right? They already come with a certain perception about religion. Religion is supposed to be individual. Religion is supposed to be private. Religion is supposed to be this. So anything that goes outside of that is radical. They're radicals. Why? Because it leaves the accepted paradigm in within which it's supposed to exist. Do you guys follow? So this is a sociological phenomenon, right? So it's part of that discursive, and modern religion is innately secular. Religion today is synonymous with secular religion or religiosity. So why are Sikhs so good? Well, because they take it back, they take everything else, but actually they don't have a problem with any of that. Why, why are Christians and Jews? Because they were the first to secularize. They were the first to liberalize. Right. But anybody who doesn't fit that, then within that other, like, you are a radical. Before they used to use the word radical, but now it's extremist. And then extremist is also generally terrorist. Right. And so the, the, uh, these terms are now used for anybody who doesn't accept the worldview of modernity and the place of religion within that worldview. Right. So good question. That kind of so of course, being is a way of being. Being, the being is everything of being. And so of course, being is more synonymous with worldview. Sure, being. Look, if you get back into like the like the tarikat of the ulama. The word being has such a long discussion going all the way back, right? Where does it come from? What's its syntactical roots, right? Uh, and being comes from the word of generally being death, right? So like one of the explanations that are given is that, look, it's the debt to God for being. The debt to God, that's literally an ontological question right there. So the debt to God of being is your being. Does that make sense, right? Um, and so it answers the ontological it answers the anthropological and the teleological, all in just one word, be. You follow, right? So the, the, uh, the heavy impact of using our own terminology rather than adopting foreign terminology, because again, terminology is not neutral. I keep emphasizing that, right? We shouldn't just easily accept, oh, X item was so and so in English terminology. Hold on, hold on. We shouldn't do that because these, these terms are loaded. They come with a lot of baggage. Philosophical baggage. Right? Actually, inshallah, we'll stop there again on the top of the hour. I don't want to keep this longer than that. And I hope to see all of you. Please bring your friends because this is why I purposely stopped here. So that if you're going to bring anybody, bring them next week. After that, don't bring anybody. I'm going to be honest. Because after that, cost, they're, they're going to get lost. Because there's a lot of building that happens. And so next week is the only chance they got to catch up, inshallah. So please bring whoever you want. Everything will benefit. If you have to drag them, you drag them, especially if they have doubts or if they have any other issues. And be in the night time, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it beneficial for all of us, inshallah.